This afternoon, we're going to talk about function templates and how they really work. But as, as has become my custom in recent years, I would like to begin by asking your help in thanking someone very important to me, and that would be my wife, who fabricates all the ties that I wear at these conferences. So if you'd kindly help me thank her, I would appreciate it. Thank you all. I'll make sure she sees this part of the video. So in this talk, we're going to discuss how compilers process function templates. In particular, the synthesis of function declarations, the instantiation of function definitions, both from a function template. We'll run across template argument deduction and a few other algorithms that compiler use compilers use, like name lookup, overload resolution, partial ordering, etc. So these are the things we're going to talk about. We will also discuss function template specialization, and in particular, we'll talk about why this is probably not a good idea for programmers to do when it comes to explicit ones. We'll make some recommendations about what you can do instead. And toward the end, as, as time permits, We'll talk a little bit about the future of function templates. We'll look at a proposal that's under discussion for C++20 in the core language and another one uh, in, the, in the standard library. So with that, I don't usually do this, but it turns out as when I started to prepare this talk, I looked around for what has already been discussed and I discovered an incredible amount of misinformation, which I like to call myth information. Uh, I'm going to quote, and I'm not going to tell you where the quotes come from because I want not to embarrass anybody, but somebody wrote, function templates are special functions, and that's just not true. Function templates are not functions of any kind, let alone special. As you're probably aware, the term special functions in C++ refers to those uh, member functions that a compiler can sometimes generate for us. And in mathematics, by the way, the term special functions, it has a much older origin. It goes back about 200 years, in case you didn't know that. Uh, at the high school level, it refers to functions like the trig functions, exponentials, things like that. At the university level, we have Bessel functions, Neumann functions, Laguerre, Legend, you know, um, and you may or may not be aware, but since C++17, we have a whole bunch of these university-level special functions now available through CMath. Um, second quote, somebody claims that a function template behaves like a function. No. There is absolutely no behavior that a function template has that is in any sense function-like. Examples, you can't call it. You can't take its address. It doesn't even exist once the program's been compiled and is running. And final quote, somebody wants to give an example and he introduces it by saying, here is the templated function. Well, no, there is no such thing as a templated function. We have function templates. We don't have template functions. We don't have templated functions. The order of the words does make a difference. Here's my favorite example of that. Think about the difference between chocolate milk and milk chocolate, right? One's a beverage, the other one's a candy for children. They're very different. The order of our words does make a difference. So a quick introduction, what really is a function template? Let me show you two examples of code. The first is very simple. Just an ordinary function, you give me two int values, and this function calculates and returns the value of the, the min of the two. Okay? You know, you may quibble about how the algorithm is phrased. Um, I claim this is the only right way to code it, but we can talk about that at some other time. But notice that the logic would apply equally well to other types right, to values that are float or double or long double or long or long long or unsigns, even to stud strings and maybe your type and my type as well. I don't want to write all of those functions. What I'd rather do is write a function in terms of some placeholder type. Let's 
name it T for the moment. Notice the only thing I've changed is I've substituted T in place of int. And of course, C++ has this rule you have to declare before you can use. So there's my declaration for T. As you're probably aware, instead of writing class up there, you can write type name, and it has exactly the same meaning. It's a placeholder for a type. That's the template parameter. When we talk about templates, we have to be a little bit careful, especially with function templates, because we have not only the traditional function uh, parameters and function arguments in the call, but we now also have template parameters and template arguments. All right, so we need to be a little bit careful to distinguish which one we mean. Usually it's clear from context, but sometimes I will stress one or the other. So the point is that a compiler will treat a function template just like a builder treats a blueprint. Builders use blueprints to make homes and other kinds of buildings. Compilers use blueprints to make function declarations and definitions. Each one of those applies whatever you have written in the template's definition to values or types of a specific type. And then that specific type replaces wherever you have used the placeholder. Okay? It's important to understand that compilers don't do this willy-nilly. They do this when and as necessary, and typically it's because that there is a call in the client code and the compiler says, hmm, I need a function to be called, let me go find one. If I can't find one, I may have to make one. And that's what this is all about. One final piece of information, if you are new to templates, templates are typically provided in headers. And there's a very simple reason for that. Imagine a builder who's told, well, there's a blueprint somewhere, but we're going to let, not let you look at it. So we want to be sure that we provide our templates in some place where the entirety of the template is clearly visible to the compiler at the point that it needs to be used. There's also some fairly standard terminology. Let's make sure we've got. Function templates in particular are often characterized as generic algorithms. And by generic, we typically mean that they are agnostic as far as type is concerned. This algorithm works no matter what type you might provide me here, provided, of course, that type meets some specific requirements. In my example on the previous page, uh, the min algorithm needed a type that was copyable, it had a less than, and so forth. All right? But any type that met those few requirements, that concept, if you will, would work. So, from a function template, a compiler can do one of two things as needed. It can synthesize, and that's the word we use, synthesize a declaration. And technically that's not quite right. What it really does is synthesize a signature. But that's very close to a declaration, and so I will tend to use the term declaration because most of us are used to declaration versus definition. And the other thing that a compiler will do with the template is to instantiate it. Again, both of these are actions are taken only when and as needed. Once instantiated, you have a function at that point, and we refer to that function as a specialization. And again, in the specialization, some specific template argument has replaced the template parameter consistently wherever it arises in that template's definition. The point, of course, being that specializations are type specific. They care very much about the type. They're no longer type agnostic. Now, as you're probably aware, C++ also allows explicit specializations, as I mentioned in the introduction. Usually, it's the compiler that does the, that instantiates the specializations. But the language does permit us, programmers, to provide our own specializations as a form of customization. 
here's the general purpose algorithm, but for this specific type, I would like it handled in a slightly different way. So explicit specializations are thought of typically as a form of customization of the generic template. In most cases, use the general, the generic template. In this particular case, do it this way. Now we're going to recommend that you not do that. Okay, but we're not ready to say why not. So give me a few minutes, we'll get there. So let's start with an example. All I've done here is overload the name G. Please look at these in detail. We'll look at this for another page or so after this one. Item number three, of course, is the easiest of all. That's just an ordinary function. Plain old function takes a double, doesn't return anything. Number one, of course, is a function template. Number two is an explicit specialization. And if you've not seen this before, the easy way to tell that this is an explicit specialization is just to look at what I've just highlighted, the empty angle brackets. That means this is an explicit function template specialization. Okay? And it'll always look like that for function templates. Now I have a couple questions for you. Now this is not a test, it's not a quiz or anything, so don't shout out answers, don't raise your hand or anything like that. But I'd like you to think about these two questions. I'll give you a few seconds and come up with an answer in your own head. Whether you're right or wrong doesn't matter, but we'll check it in just a few seconds. Here we go. I can't play more of the song because it's copyright. <laughs> By the way, in case you didn't know, the title of that little song is called Think. Okay, so two questions. Everybody have some answers? Yeah? Okay. Well, the first one is particularly easy since I numbered them for you. There are three declarations. Now, you may think that the answer to the second question is the same, but it's not. There are two names that are being introduced. You can think of them as mangled names if you prefer. But the specialization does not introduce a new name. It reuses an existing name. You can't provide a specialization unless you've already provided the primary template. So that's not a new name. So you've got two names that are being introduced, but you have three declarations. We'll revisit this a little bit later on. Let's look at the same example a second time, and I have some different questions for you. What happens when you call G? And here are some samples for you to think about. What happens if you call it with an int, with a double, with a char, um, with an array of char? Make up your own type, stud string. What happens if you call? All right, here are the questions. How many function declarations, remember technically signatures, but how many declarations will be candidates for the compiler's overload resolution algorithm? How many candidates will there be? And of course, what are they? Okay, please take a few seconds and then we'll review. Okay, everybody got some answers? Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. You'll remember it better if you've tried it first. All right, here's the spoiler. The same three declarations, and I've given you a clue up there. I've taken away the numbers and provided you a check mark. The answer is that there will be at most two candidates. Now, technically I have to say at most because there's some corner cases where there's only one, but typically there will be two. And what are they? Well, here's the easy one. Certainly the ordinary function goes into the mix. It's a candidate. 
It's even a viable candidate. For example, it's got the right number of uh, function parameters, right? So that's a candidate. What's the other candidate? It's a synthesized function declaration that looks like that. And I hope you're almost immediately saying, what the dickens is D? Well, D is something that the compiler has to figure out. Okay? It's usually deduced when the compiler inspects the call. Remember, this all starts with somebody writing a call to G. There's no call to G. There's no reason for the compiler to do any of this. Right? So there's a call to G. That call has some function arguments in it. The compiler can inspect them and do some type deduction. And I actually have some extra slides on that topic. I won't have time to go through them today, but if you download the slides um, once they're available from CPPCon's website, you'll find some extra slides. If you notice, the, the slide numbers might not always be contiguous. That's because there are some missing slides in a couple places. They're just hidden. Okay? So that type D will be deduced by the compiler by looking at the type of the function argument in the call. Then the compiler copies the declaration of the function template and substitutes for the placeholder, the template parameter T, its deduction for D. Every place that there is a T, it'll replace it with whatever it's figured out, which I've here labeled D. Okay? And if you ever need to ensure that that particular substitution takes place, you can always write it as shown on the last line. And that forces, a, you know, it says, compiler, don't waste your time deducing, do it this way. Okay? And sometimes you want to do that in a call. If you want to ensure that a particular, a particular um, specialization gets called, you can force it by putting in your own um, type there as a substitution for the template parameter. Now, a lot of people are puzzled, and they say, well, why is the template itself not a candidate? The answer is actually to be surprisingly, turns out to be surprisingly simple. Remember, templates don't have function-like behavior. As I said earlier, you can't call a template. So why consider it as a, as a candidate? It can, you can never pick it. can't call it. Right? Templates are not function and they're not any other kind of callable entity. I mean, there are lots of things that you can call. You can call with a function pointer. You can call um, uh, with objects that have a, an operator parents, you know, function objects. So there are lots of things that you can call. A function template is none of those things. You can't call it. Therefore, templates are never candidates for overload resolution. Now, Here's another way to think about it, for those of you who are, who are visual thinkers. A cookie cutter is like a function template. And if you speak British English, we're talking about biscuit cutters. Okay? The cookie dough is like template arguments. You put those two things together and you get a cookie, in our case, a function. And of course, Use different dough, get a different kind of cookie. And that analogy will take you surprisingly far, by the way. I've taught like teenagers about function templates by appealing to this picture, and they get it. Okay, so feel free to use this. All right, so why really can't you call a function template? <laughs> Would you try to eat the cookie cutter? I don't think it would taste very good, right? A cookie cutter isn't edible because it's not a cookie. A function template isn't callable because it's not a function. It's something else, right? So a template can never be a candidate. But since we can use cookie cutters plus cookie dough to make cookies, we can use function templates plus function template arguments 
to make functions. And of course, the point is that the compiler will do that for us. The compiler will synthesize a function declaration from that primary function template declaration. But remember, it first inspects the call, deduces the types necessary by looking at the, at the function arguments in the call, uses the result of that deduction and substitutes as appropriate for the placeholders, which are the template parameters. And the net result is that you get a synthesized candidate for overload resolution. Now, overload resolution is just going to do its normal thing. I mean, among the very first things overload resolution does is look at all the possible candidates and say which ones are just not viable. For example, it has the wrong number of function parameters. Well, that can't possibly be chosen, so that gets thrown out almost immediately. But that's part of overload resolution. That's got nothing to do with the fact that we're dealing with, with uh, template specializations here. Uh, uh, sy sorry, synthesized declarations. All right, so the other question that I get asked from this example is, okay, but we have this explicit specialization sitting there. How come that's not a candidate? Because th this is a function, right? A specialization is a function. Doesn't matter if the compiler produces it or if you produce it explicitly. It's a function. So why is that not a candidate for overload resolution? Well, it doesn't work that way. It's a declaration, but remember, there are declarations that don't introduce names. For most programmers, it's sort of, you know, you ask them like a trivial question, true or false, you write declarations to introduce names, and almost everybody will say, yep, that's what you do it. That's what the purpose is. And that's just not quite true. There are declarations that do not introduce new names. My favorite example is static assert. Not many C++ programmers know this, but if you look at the grammar, static assert is a declaration. It sure doesn't introduce any new names, right? Also, we all know that you can redeclare something as often as you like. That doesn't introduce a new name. It recycles an existing name. You're redeclaring it in the same way. Now, of more interest to us, the standard very clearly says, and there's the reference if you want to go look it up, an explicit specialization of a template does not introduce a name. And that's the reason that specializations don't take part in overload resolution, okay? And this is key. I suspect that the vast majority of C++ programmers would intuit that if you write an explicit specialization, of course it'll be considered an overload resolution, and if it fits, it's gonna be picked. It's not the way it works. Specializations are never candidates for overload resolution. If you take away nothing else from this talk, that's the key. Specializations do not participate in overload resolution. Okay, so we've talked about declarations, candidates for overload resolution. At some point, you actually need a function to be compiled. So where is that? Well, suppose we've gone through overload resolution and we've picked one of the candidates from that particular class, uh, sorry, from that particular function template. So for example, if the call says G of 42, then that specialization, sorry, that declaration will be synthesized if the call is a G of a character, a different declaration will be synthesized. All right? So suppose we've actually gone through overload resolution and we've picked such a declaration. Now we need a definition. Right? Notice, don't need any definitions until now. Overload resolution does not look at definitions. 
It looks only at declarations. Okay? So there are two cases. Case one, there might be a pre-existing specialization of that template such that its template arguments match the ones of the chosen candidate. Now that can come about in at least two different ways. There might be an explicit specialization like that, or an equivalent call might have been encountered previously and the compiler has already instantiated that specialization. So if there is an appropriate pre-existing specialization, then that specialization is going to be compiled. And maybe already has. And then ultimately, of course, that's the one that will be called later. Case two, of course, is otherwise. There is no pre-existing specialization. So the compiler now has to instantiate one that matches, etc. And how does it do that? It replicates the definition from the primary template, does the appropriate substitution. Notice it doesn't have to figure it out again. That's already happened when it picked the declaration. Now it carries through that same substitution in the definition. And now we have a specialization that's ready to be compiled. That's the function that will be compiled, will show up in the object file, and is going to be called when the program runs. Okay? So those are the main important steps. Now, there's some interesting situations that you can get into. Suppose you have more than one function template by the same name. Yes, function templates can overload each other as well as ordinary functions. So imagine you have multiple templates all by the same name and each one can give you a candidate for a particular call. The compiler has to pick one if it can. So as part of overload resolution, uh, you might want to think of this as a separate step or you might want to think of it as a sub-step of overload resolution, but at the appropriate point, there's this algorithm called partial ordering of function templates. And it's a non-trivial algorithm, but the point is to handle cases like this. And it's called partial ordering because sometimes the compiler just can't pick one. There's no reason to prefer one over the other. The objective is to pick, and the phrase is, the most specialized of the viable templates or candidates, right? We want to pick one. And the criterion is which is the most specialized. If only two, you say more specialized. But right, in general, it's the most specialized. So here's a, a specific example. Suppose you have one function template that has a function parameter of type T. And the second function template, the overload, has a function parameter of type pointer to t. Okay? And suppose we have a call with a, with a function argument of some pointer type. I don't care what the value is, just think about the type. It's some pointer type. Maybe it's int star or double star, it doesn't matter. Okay? It turns out that the function template that has a function parameter of type T star is considered more specialized than the other one, even though both are otherwise viable matches. Okay? And without going into the algorithm in detail, the upshot is the compiler tries it both ways. If I do it this way, can the other one still work? If I do it the other way, can this one still work? And it turns out you can only do that in one direction, and so it picks the one that's more specialized. Now, 
here's a chance for you to show off what you know. Again, don't shout out anything, don't raise your hand, but let's look at a different example. All right? And by now you can all tell what these things are. I've labeled them for reference A, B, and C. And the question for you to resolve is, given these two, say, uh, these two uh, uh, statements, which H is going to be called? I'll give you a few extra seconds. This is not quite as easy as before. Yes, this really is legal code. You can do this. Now we can argue all day as to whether you should do this, but you can do this. Okay, you ready for the answer? Everybody got an answer? All right. It's going to call a specialization of C. Now, if you find that surprising, let's go through it in a little bit of detail. Always ask the question, what are the candidates that will be considered for overload resolution? And there are two. You have a candidate from template A, and you have a candidate contributed by template C. B does not factor into overload resolution because it's an explicit specialization. See the empty angle brackets? We have to ignore that for the time being. So the issue is, which of the candidates is more specialized? And the answer is C, exactly as we explained on the previous page. Do notice, and perhaps you'll be surprised by this, the explicit specialization B it's a specialization of template A. It can't be a specialization of template C. And the reason for that is like Computer Science 101, introductory course. At the point that the compiler sees that specialization, the only declaration of G that it has previously seen is A. It's the only one that's in scope. There's no look ahead, right? Okay, so the only possible candidate that B could be a specialization of is A. Oh wait, I used the word candidate. This is a different kind of candidate. When the compiler sees a specialization, it has to say, okay, I see that it's a specialization, but of what? So there's a form of overload resolution that kicks in here. Overload resolution does not only apply when there are function calls. There are other circumstances for other forms of overload resolution, okay? And this is one of them. Here's an explicit specialization. To which primary template does it belong? What template does it specialize? And here it's easy because there's only one candidate. Nah, let's change the example a little bit. Same declarations, slight rearrangement. Same question. Go. Okay, I'm seeing some light bulbs going on in people's eyes. Okay, 
Ready for the answer? Good. It's going to call B. Okay. So what changed? All I did was move B down one line. What changed? When the compiler figures out which template, of which template is B a specialization, it has to consider both A and C. They're both in scope. All right? Partial ordering kicks in. And it's going to pick C as the primary template that corresponds to the explicit specialization B. Now, when it comes to figuring out what to call, it's A still A versus C. And for exactly the same reasons as before, it's going to pick the specialization, sorry, it's going to pick the declaration synthesized from C. That has not changed from the previous page. What has changed is there is already an existing specialization, namely B, and that's why B gets called. Okay? One more just for kicks. Put them back in the same order and throw in D. Look at the declarations of B and D. Don't they look similar? Except, of course, for the body, which I haven't shown you. Is this still legal code? And if so, now what's going to get called? Go. I'll give you a little extra time on this one. I see some people nodding their heads. Are we ready? Yeah, okay. No? Okay. Give me a few more seconds. One second. All right, here we go. We're going to call D. D is in dog. Work out where the specializations come from. B as in boy is still an explicit specialization of A because that's the only one that's in scope at that point. D as in dog is an explicit specialization of C. Both A and C are in scope, and for the exact same reasons we discussed on the previous page, the compiler figures out that D belongs with C. Now we get synthesized candidates from A and C as before, and C is still chosen. And we have a matching explicit specialization, and that's D. So we're going to end up calling D. What is kind of interesting is the substitutions. In the case of specialization B, the template parameter T from the primary, it's replaced by pointer to int. In the second specialization, the template parameter T is replaced only by int. Why? because the star, the asterisk, is already part of the function parameter, right? Deduction happens on the basis of function parameters and function arguments, okay? All right, so having gone through that, let's return to the topic of explicit specializations. Using explicit specialization as a form of customization for function templates, 
is considered by many, many programmers to be not a good thing to do. And by the way, this is not a new development. This has been known for at least 20 some years. You should avoid this if at all possible. It's wrong to use fun function template specialization because it interacts in bad ways with overloads. Overload resolution does not take into account explicit specialization of function templates. Most programmers believe the opposite, and it's simply wrong. That's not how specializations work. Okay? Explicit specializations are not part of overload resolution. Only after overload resolution has made a choice will any explicit specializations be considered. Okay? Now, this has been known for a long time, but I've discovered it's not particularly well known. So, you know, please go forth and evangelize. So here's some advice. Avoid it. Avoid writing explicit specializations of function templates. Please remember, I'm talking about function templates. There are other kinds of templates. This advice does not apply there. It's function templates that you can overload, not those other kinds of templates, right? If you do need to customize your function template, just write an ordinary function by the same name with whatever arguments you want. Okay? Sorry, with whatever parameters you want. Okay. If you have to specialize, do it indirectly. So the starting point is just to recall that class templates can't overload, right? Types don't overload. Okay, so we can take advantage of that fact. Invent a helper class template with an apply operator, a call operator if you prefer. Specialize that one to your heart's content. Okay. and then write the original function template so all it does is forward the call to the class template's operator parents. And all the special logic takes place in the class. Okay? Yes, it's one level of indirection, but it gets you around all of the issues involving function template specialization. You also get some other things for free. It's not on topic for this talk, but there is such a thing as partial specialization. It does not apply to function templates. It does apply, for example, to class templates and variable templates, etc. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, Robert Heinlein. Yeah, it's for compilers to do, not so much for uh, us programmers. Okay, so what's in store? Well, I want to talk about two proposals that are going to be before the uh, standardization committee at the upcoming meeting in November, which will be held in San Diego, California. Um, I don't know what will happen with either of these proposals. One is a little bit farther advanced than the other one, but neither has yet been voted into the next C++ working paper. In the standard library, for a long time, we have allowed programmers to provide explicit specializations of the function templates that constitute so much of the standard library. There are an awful lot of function templates in the standard library like almost everything in the algorithms header and a whole lot of others. The utilities header has got lots of function templates in it, right? 
Even utilities like move and forward are function templates. Okay? Technically, you could specialize those. This is a nightmare for those of us who write the standard library. It's a nightmare to take that into account. Imagine calling stood forward and having it do something different and not knowing. Oops. So, permission to do that is being withdrawn. Yeah, I had a little something to do with that. And the words are, are uh, en route, and I think this is going to happen. But there are still cases where you want to specialize somehow. Well, customize. Okay? So some algorithms are going to be re-specified. This has not yet happened, but it's, as I say, it's en route. And what they will become will be called customization point objects. Now you know that you can call a function object as if it were a function. So from the call side, you can't tell the difference. But there is a technical difference. We will allow you to write your own customizations just by writing your own ordinary function. Don't do anything with function templates. Just customize it by writing your own function. For example, you have a type and it has a particularly efficient way of swapping. Go ahead and write your own swap function that does whatever is necessary for your type. But do it in your namespace. Stay out of stood. Okay? And it's going to work. We know how to do this. We've known how to do this for several years now. As a bonus, you'll be able to call swap either qualified or unqualified. And I mean stud qualified, right? You call stud swap. It'll find your function if that's the best match. Okay? As I say, we know how to make this work. Uh, if you're curious, there's a paper by Eric Niebler of about three or four years ago. He lays out how to do it. C++ 17, we can do it still better because we have some new features in the language like inline variables and things like that. Okay? So we can do it better. But we know how to make this work. And if you are an author of generic code, until now, you have to do what a lot of us call the, the two-step dance. Right? If there might be a specialization somewhere. First you have to bring the swap from the standard namespace into scope and then call unqualified. And now overload resolution will kick in. That's what you have to do today. You won't have to do that in the future. This will do the right thing. This will just work. So programmers will have far fewer reasons to put stuff into STD. As I say, those of us who write standard library code, it'll make our life a lot easier, trust me. Okay? So that's number one. There's also a proposal up for consideration at the next meeting that involves the core language, not the library. So we're looking at ways to write function templates using a simpler syntax. Okay? So this ties into Bjarne's talk from this morning. I hope you were there and listened to it. We can already do this because we have return type deduction. We've had that for a number of years, right? But this is just an ordinary function template that you can write today. But instead of having to use the keyword template and a declaration, we're thinking about letting you write auto as the key to the compiler that says, okay, you figure out the right type. 
And if you want a reference, you can write auto ref or auto const ref and whatever, and it'll do the right deduction. Now that assumes you don't have to name the type anywhere else. But if this is sufficient, and surprisingly often it is, then this is a simpler way of writing it. As I say, under consideration, no guarantees. What's interesting is that this is intended to work with what we are calling constrained declarations. The long form of a constrained declaration is one that has a requires clause in it. Okay? And you can write this today if you enable, if you use GCC, you turn on, uh, what is it, dash F concepts, I think it is. This works today. Okay? I'm assuming you have a concept named sortable. This is the way Stepanov has always envisioned how it should work. You go back to, to, to his early work 20-some 20, 20 years ago. This is what he writes. Go online and, and listen to his, the talks he gave before he retired. I mean, set aside like a week or two, because there are a lot of them. And, but they're well worth it. I recommend them highly. But this looks to be en route for C++20. And what's being proposed now is tentatively being termed adjective syntax, which may or may not make it into C++20. We have not yet considered it. This is a fairly recent paper. But uh, a lot of people think it shows some promise, and I think it'll be given serious consideration. Okay? All right, so what have we not talked about today? If you're getting into templates, obviously you have a couple of uh, directions to go and learn more. Class templates, alias templates since C++11, variable templates since C++14. Templates that have more than one template parameter, because there are opportunities for interactions there. Okay. Templates that involve parameter packs, that involve other kinds of template parameters, like non-type template parameter, or a template template parameter. Yes, a template parameter that is a template. If that confuses you, think of it as a, as a uh, callback. Think of it as declaring a callback. Okay? It works. Something new in C17 called class template argument deduction. Before C17, if you wanted a vector of int, you always had to say vector angle bracket int. In C17, you can leave off the angle brackets and just say vector if you provide an initializer for your variable, and the compiler can deduce the right type by inspecting the initializer. It's called class template argument deduction. One of the best things in C++17. Terrific. I had very little to do with it, but I was, I was involved just a bit. Um, there's template metaprogramming. And if you want to follow up on that, I refer you first to the video of my talks from, uh, from the first CppCon back in 2014. We now have constrained templates since the concepts TS and likely in C++20. And above all, if you really want to, to understand templates, I highly recommend this book, uh, second edition by Van der Voord, Yusutis, and Doug Greger. Um, consider it the Bible as far as anything to do with templates. Thank you all very much. We have a few minutes. If there are questions, what I would ask, if you would be so kind, there's a microphone over here, and that way they can capture your, your voice uh, for, uh, for posterity, I guess. Sorry to make you walk. They only set up one microphone in this room. Sir. Hi. Um, you, you meant the upcoming stuff, I guess, was pretty general. I just had, like, one specific question. Uh, I guess about function templates. So 
One of my least favorite two-step dances with function templates are index sequence because you just always have to create like an underscore impl function as far as I know. Uh, and you know, like create it and pass it and then it gets deduced and so on. Is there any plan to not have to do that two-step dance anymore? I am unaware of any proposal that addresses that. Okay. Would okay. you like to write one? <laughs> uh, I don't think I know enough, but. You know, I'll help. I, okay, deal. <laughs> Send me email. Sure. Thank you. Sir. I believe the two-step dance you were talking about involves using ADL to decide what swap to, to do, the one outside the, the standard namespace. Yes. Does the new thing that's being proposed also use ADL or generalize it, or is it something completely different? Um, ADL is involved, but less overtly than before. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if you're interested in the details, I highly recommend I think there's also a, a blog by Eric that sets out some of it. I'm not sure, but I know there's a paper that goes back a few years in which he sets out the technology of that era, but we now know how to do it even better. Thank you. Sir. In the example you have on slide 22, I had a question about the arrangement of the templates. Is there any way That would to, be this? Yes. That okay, one. Let, me is there, let me study it again. Okay, yes. Is there any way once all four of these declarations have been seen to call B? Is it callable by any possible mechanism? Uh, yes. You can provide, remember the explicit notation? You fill in the angle brackets and deduction is turned off. But if you pass in the angle brackets in star, aren't you going to get D? Um... No, because that's that would be in star star. Uh, I'm, I'm going backwards, sorry. I shouldn't answer questions like this on the fly. I think the answer is yes. I think that's the right way to do it. I may have the details wrong right now, okay. but let's talk offline if you like. Sounds good. Okay, yeah, Thank thanks. You. Yes, sir. So I don't remember which slide number it was, but on one of them you suggested using a class template. Um, uh, yes, 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 yes. And I was wondering what the trade-offs are between having a function that forwards to that versus a template variable of the type of the function object. I believe you're referring to this slide, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what the trade-offs are there. Um, which kind of, are you talking about performance? or compile time, or Developer what? Developer what? sanity, mainly. I'm sorry? Developer sa sanity, mainly. Oh, for, but forwarding is a time-honored technique. We've been doing this for you know, decades, at least. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, this doesn't even come close to insane on the level of code that I've seen. <laughs> now that we have uh, variable templates, does that change that, at what you would recommend at all? Um, Variable templates are actually a special case of class templates. Think about a class template that has a, that has a static member variable. You now have variable templates, right? Uh, and I think that's how it's implemented. Mm -hmm. it, it, by the way, in case you're curious, the way we got variable templates in the standard, we struck out a line mm -hmm. and suddenly they worked. <laughs> I, think that was the ex I think that was the extent of the change to the wording of the standard. We took out way of restriction, and then we got variable templates. So I, maybe a little bit, but I think not significantly, no. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. One uh, more question. Last one. So when you talk about function templates here, are you also including the function templates in a class? Would that same overload resolution apply? I believe, you, what, I believe what you're discussing is usually called member function templates. Yes. Um, I believe the answer is yes, but now you have an extra scope to worry about. I'm just saying within the yeah. class scope. Within the, within, it works just fine. If you want to drive yourself crazy, have a member function template that's a member of a class template because now you have two sets of template arguments, one for the type and one for the function. But it works, and there are good use cases for all of that. Yeah, I don't think 
you would specialize fully specialize a member function template. It is possible, but it, I'm sure it's possible. It is. It is I'm possible just saying, to does do. Does your yeah. rules apply to that overload resolution set on a member function set? I'm not persuaded that you're right, but we can talk about that more if you like. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you.